I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. Shema Israel Adonai Adahenu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of the, our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we in the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah, beginning with chapter 3, verse 19. Then I said, How I would set among you my sons and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of the nations. And I said, You shall call me my father and not turn away from following me. Surely as a woman treacherously departs from her lover, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. A voice is heard on the bare heights, the weeping and the supplications of the sons of Israel. Because they have perverted their way, they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, O faithless sons, 
I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Surely the hills are a deception, a tumult on the mountains. Surely in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. But the shameful thing has consumed the labor of our fathers since our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame and let our humiliation cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even to this day, and we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God." If you will return, O Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. And if you will put away your detested things from my presence and will not waver, and you will swear as the Lord lives, in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory." For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Or else my wrath will go forth like fire, and burn with none to quench it, because of the evil of your deeds." This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 130. We will read this together in unison. Out of the deep have I called unto you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. O let your ears consider well the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, were to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, Who could abide it? For there is mercy with you. Therefore, you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my trust. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, trust in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, beginning in chapter 7 with verse 17. Only as the Lord has assigned each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather, do that. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. This is the word of the Lord.
morning and welcome to Christ Church on this third Sunday of the Epiphany. Our gospel reading is taken from Mark's gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. Immediately, Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. This is the gospel of Christ. I want to talk this morning about covenant and covenant is a concept that I confess I had no knowledge of growing up in the Episcopal Church. I think probably those of you who come from Presbyterian backgrounds will have a better idea of covenant than most of us Episcopalians had. But covenant was something I didn't understand, uh, was never explained to me, and until I began to read the scripture for myself, I didn't realize what a covenant was. But we find several covenants in scripture. Uh, we have the covenant that God made with Noah. We have the covenant that God made with Abraham. We have the covenant that God made with Moses on Mount Sinai. We have the promise, prophetically, in Jeremiah 31, of the new covenant that God will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And we have Jesus at the Last Supper proclaiming that that new covenant will be inaugurated through his death on the cross the next day. So, Scripture is full of covenant. And I want us to think about what a covenant is. Well, a covenant is something that God initiates. We don't go to God and say, God, I would like to uh, have an agreement with you. God is the one who is the initiator of the covenant. He is the one who guarantees the covenant because he is the only one who has the power to guarantee the covenant. And this is based upon the fact that, number one, he's got the power, but number two, God is faithful. He never fails to fulfill his word. So when God offers a covenant or presents a covenant to be entered into, he is the one who initiates that, but he's the one who guarantees that, and he is the one who will see that covenant through until the end. In our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah today, uh, we have the, the reminder of Israel's faithlessness and the fact that even though God had made a covenant, both with Abraham and later with Moses, that Israel was not faithful to that covenant, that they had turned their backs on God, that they had backslidden and uh, were in need of, of returning to the Lord. We're in need of repentance. And at the beginning of uh, chapter 4 of Jeremiah, we read today, If you will return, O Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. And if you will put away your detested things, that is the idolatrous practice that they had adopted, the, if you will put those things away from my presence and will not waver, and you will swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness. Then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory. So the Lord is calling Israel to repentance. Israel had um, outwardly trusted in the sign of the covenant, which was given to Abraham when God made that covenant with Abraham. And what was that sign? I have to go back to Genesis chapter 17. That sign was uh, circumcision. 
and it was outward and visible. You know, the definition of a sacrament in the 39 articles is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. So in the Old Covenant, the, the sign, the symbol, the sacrament was circumcision. But that wasn't enough because what God was interested in was not just an outward sign, but he was more interested in the inward and spiritual grace. Now, if you've joined us on Tuesday night, I'm going to make a plug for Tuesday night. Please join us. We send out an email on Tuesday mornings inviting everyone to come. It's done on Zoom, and we are in the book of Romans, which is probably, if you had to pick one book of the Bible to say this one book has been the most influential on human history, it would be Romans. Because in Romans, Paul goes into a great deal of detail about covenant, about the covenant that God made with Abraham, which preceded the covenant of the law, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai to Moses. And the basis of this covenant was Abraham's response in faith. Abraham believed God, we're told, in Genesis 12, and it was reckoned to him or counted toward him as righteousness. So it was the fact that, that Abraham, who didn't have any of the things that we've got, he didn't have a Bible, he didn't have a, a faithful community to relate to, he simply had the call of God, but he believed, he trusted, he responded in faith, and he set out from his home into the unknown. He was responding to God's call. And God said, I will lead you and show you the place that I have given to you and to your descendants. So Abraham has ups and downs in his faith relationship with God. And one of the downs was when he got tired of waiting on God. God had promised him a son who would be the heir of the covenant. And Abraham was getting old. Sarah was old, past the age of childbearing. And Abraham said, this is not going to work. And so with agreement of his wife, Sarah, he goes into his, his maid, Hagar, and they produce a son called Ishmael. Ishmael was not the child of the promise. He was the child of Abraham's impatience, and in a sense of Abraham's faithlessness. So in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham must be thinking, you know, Ishmael is, is uh, the child who will inherit everything. He's 99 years old, and the Lord appears to Abraham again. And he said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant, that's the covenant that he made with him in Genesis chapter 12, between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of a multitude of nations. Your, no, your name shall no longer be called Avram in Hebrew, which means exalted father, but your name shall be called Avraham, which means the father of the nation. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations come forth from you and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant is that word again, brit in Hebrew. I will establish my brit between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. I'll say that again. It's not a temporary covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is everlasting. The expression used in Hebrew means in perpetuity. Ad olam. There's no time limit to it. I will establish this covenant as an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. 
I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings. That is the land of Israel. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Again, that word everlasting. It's not a temporary gift of the land. It is an everlasting gift of the land. God said further to Abram, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. That was the outward and visible sign of the inward and spiritual grace of the covenant. Now, what was Abraham's response? Well, he couldn't believe it. And uh, he tells Sarah, she laughs, he laughs, and Abraham fell on his face and laughed, it says, and said in his heart, will the child be born to a man a hundred years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before me. He's going back to his faithless act of having a child with Hagar. And he's asking God to fulfill this covenant through Ishmael. And what is God's response? He said, No. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Yitzhak. Isaac, we say in English. Yitzhak means he laughs. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant. Again, Adolam in perpetuity for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, and this shows God's great mercy, even though Ishmael was not God's plan A, God nevertheless blesses Ishmael. He said, I've heard you, and behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, my breed, I will establish with Yitzhak, with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. This is God's fulfillment of the original call that he placed on Abram's life in Genesis chapter 12. God promised that through his descendants, his physical descendants, he would bring blessing to the earth. And of course, ultimately, through the physical descendants of Abraham comes Yeshua HaNotsri, Jesus the Messiah, who brings blessing to the earth in the form of a new covenant, which is promised in Jeremiah 31. Jesus came to fulfill all the promises of God we're told he came in the fullness of time at just the right time. Jesus appears, born of a woman, born is the same way that all of us are born, and he comes into this world. But the principle of the covenant and how the covenant is entered into rests on Abraham, and that covenant is entered into by faith. Abraham believed God. And Paul in Romans goes into a great deal of detail about this. It was Abraham's faith that justified him. It was Abraham's faith response to God's promise to his offer of the covenant that allowed Abraham to come into a personal relationship with him. And that principle of faith is still the principle whereby we enter into the new covenant. And all of us have been called to come into that new covenant. In our gospel reading this morning, we read of Jesus beginning to proclaim the gospel. And his message was simple and straightforward. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Meaning that he came to bring, to usher in the new covenant. 
whereby our sins could be forgiven. Not just ritually forgiven, as in the old covenant with the offer of an animal sacrifice, but permanently forgiven. And the response for entering into that covenant is the same response that Abraham had. We have to respond in faith. That's God's call to us. And this covenant is extended far beyond the house of Israel and the house of Judah. As we read in Jeremiah 31, it's made initially with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's why Jesus said, I came first and foremost to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's why Paul in the beginning of Romans said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the non-Jew, for the Gentile. We have been called and grafted in, according to Ephesians and Romans 11. We've been grafted in as a wild olive branch into this new covenant that God promises and that really is what Jesus is saying when he says the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. It's not here in its fullness yet. Jesus came to bring the kingdom, to usher in the kingdom. And when we come into a relationship with him, our citizenship is now in heaven. We are subjects, not citizens. We are subjects of the kingdom of God. We belong to him. That's our first and foremost allegiance. Someone was asking me the other day, they were distraught about the political situation. We're not to be distraught about anything in this world because our citizenship or our subjectship is in heaven. We belong to another kingdom. And that citizenship, that subjectship cannot be taken away. It's permanent. The moment we enter into God's new covenant, by responding in faith to the offer that he's made to us in the person of his son, Jesus. We become citizens. We've been translated, as Paul says, out of the kingdom of darkness, that is the kingdom of Satan, which we're all born into as a result of the fall, into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And so we have a new citizenship. We have a new identity. We have new promises that we can rest in, according to Hebrews. We've entered into the Shabbat rest or the Sabbath rest of God by virtue of the fact that we've come into this covenant. We can not only rest in it, we can rejoice in it because we know as God promised to Abraham's physical descendants that his covenant with Abraham and his descendants through Isaac was in perpetuity. His promise to us as we come into the new covenant is that we are citizens of God forever. That he will not let go of us, that we are his, that we belong to him. And as we read last Tuesday night in our study of Romans, if we have been saved by what Jesus did for us on the cross, by his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, how much more are we now being saved by his life? Because Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. And we can now call ourselves the children of God. And we can rejoice and rest in that identity. That's the good news. That's why we need to rejoice this Sunday. We need to be excited. I was reading... Uh, am reading a fascinating book about the uh, history of four different settlements that occurred in British America from different parts of Britain and the different uh, characteristics of each one of them. And one of them was fascinating because it said that the, um, the one thing that Anglican clergy was speaking about Virginia, the one thing that the Anglican clergy feared the most was something called enthusiasm in worship. You see, enthusiasm was practiced by some of the people that lived in the backwoods who came from, the, from Northern Ireland, from, uh, from uh, Ulster, 
and from uh, Northern Britain. These were not the refined people. This was the back country. But these people experienced revival, and when they experienced revival, they weren't ashamed to show some emotion. And the Anglicans were scared of that. They said, that's enthusiasm. Well, I know a lot of Anglicans who, Episcopalians uh, and Presbyterians, who get excited about things. It's usually football games, sometimes other stuff. But I think the Lord wants us to be excited. I think he wants us to be enthusiastic about the covenant that he has made with us in the person of his son, Jesus. That we can rejoice in that, we can celebrate that. And that's what we do every Sunday morning. We do something called the Eucharist, which in Greek means thanksgiving. We're offering thanks to God. We're praising him for who he is and what he's done for us in the person of his son, Jesus. That's what true worship is. And I would encourage all of us this morning to remind ourselves of the principles of covenant, that God initiates the covenant and we respond to what he's initiated. And even that response is his grace. Apart from his grace, we can do nothing. We can't even respond. We can't even believe. But we're told in Ephesians that God has lavished that grace upon us. And that grace is present here today. And the offer of coming into his covenant is made by him today to all of us. And just as he was calling out to Israel, who had come into that covenant but wandered away from it, he calls out to us today that if we've wandered away, if our love has grown cold, if we've found it hard to believe, and all of us go through those times when we find it hard to believe, and we, we feel like God is far away, far removed from us, but he never leaves us. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So he's with us here today, and he, he's calling us to come home. He's calling us to return, as he called Israel into that covenant relationship with him, which he has secured for us through the blood of his son, Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand and confess our faith, saying together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to either sit or kneel as we enter into our prayers. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, 
Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop and Diocesan Bishop, for Frank, David, and Taro, his assisting bishops, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joe, our president, Brian, our governor, and Keisha, our mayor, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those suffering from COVID-19, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I now invite you to offer your own prayers and petitions at this time. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. And now saying together, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker and judge of us all, we acknowledge and lament of our many sins and offenses which we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your righteous anger against us. We are deeply sorry for these, our transgressions. The burden of them is more than we can bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may evermore serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised the forgiveness of sins to all who truly repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon, deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and with your spirit. Greet each other at home in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on mortal flesh to reveal his glory, that he might bring us out of darkness and into his own glorious light. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all of the company of heaven 
who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. you to either sit or kneel at home. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Heavenly Father. For in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. So now, O merciful Father, in your great goodness, we ask you to bless and sanctify with your word and Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution in remembrance of his death and passion may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For on the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of your dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, your humble servants, celebrate and make here before your divine majesty with these holy gifts the memorial your Son commanded us to make, remembering his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and his promise to come again. And we earnestly desire your fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, asking you to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may obtain forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. We humbly pray that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy because of our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we ask you to accept this duty and service we owe, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all. 
upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Saying together, We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Let us now pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us through this sacrament of your favor and goodness towards us that we are true members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. And we humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all the good works that you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.